Welcome to Category 5 Technology TV. What you're about to experience is a free, worldwide, interactive broadcast from Ontario, Canada. We broadcast live every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Get your questions in. Join the community chat room at www.category5.tv or email us at live at category5.tv. And now, let's begin. Here's your host, Robbie Ferguson. <laughs> Welcome to episode number 190 of Category 5. Oh, 191. Oh my goodness, that's Category way better than 190. I know, we're like one up on ourselves. I know. <laughs> it's Tuesday, May the 17th, 2011. Great to see you. Nice to have everybody joining us in the chat room. If you're not already in the chat room, make sure you join us. It is Category 5 on Freenode, or you can get there right through our web system. It's like this cool thing called a website, Category5.tv. Cool. <laughs> Pretty feature rich when you can get in there and chat with other viewers and mm -hmm. talk to us, get your questions in live, cool stuff. And tonight we're going to be uh, we're going to be continuing our web development series. Eleven weeks in. Wow. I know. <laughs> I think it, we'd have a whole website by I'm now. I'm pretty sure somebody in the chat room just said it keeps going and going. It's like the Energizer Bunny. It's just I was gonna <laughs> say, but now we need to endorse that we are sponsored in part by Eco Alkalines and. Good going. Now we're in trouble. Oh, my bad. You can blame it on me. Blame Just it on the designer. This battery <laughs> at you. Is that called I, battery? Would I get I charged so. with battery? I think we should try it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, okay. Lots of cool stuff coming up. Uh, we have a new feature on our website, category5.tv. I'm going to take you there and check this out. This was requested by viewers. And uh, we love to uh, to provide you with some cool features on our website that are specific to what you want. You'll notice that under Watch the Show, RSS Feeds menu item has been changed to Subscriptions and RSS Feeds, and there's good reason for that. If you scroll down on the page, you'll see that now you can subscribe to Category 5 TV via your email account. What that's going to do is that every week when the show comes out on the RSS Feeds, Rather than having to subscribe through an aggregator, you're going to actually get an email in your inbox that's just simple and says, here's a link to the file, this is what the show's about, and, uh, and you'll get that once a week. So I think that's a pretty cool feature, and uh, again, was requested by uh, some of our viewers, so uh, I'm happy to put that into place. Cool. Cool. How's your week going? Oh, actually surprisingly slow. Slow like... So, like, I don't have a ton of work to do this Like, week. it's just good? Yeah. That'd well, be so nice. No, because I go nuts. I get a little jittery, really? and I have to do something. I've so. had kind of the opposite, where I, I think I mentioned it a couple shows back, where I was pushing people to get me content to get yeah. websites finished, and all, all of them came together in. all at the same time. <laughs> and you don't expect that, because yeah. quite often it takes a long time to get content. Um, so, uh, I... I kind of kicked myself a little bit and be like, oh, you got to limit yourself a little bit. <laughs> but I'm learning. So it's been really busy the past couple of weeks. But I am uh, I'm hanging in there. Mm -hmm. Thanks for asking. Oh, yeah. No, no problem. Uh, we did get uh, <laughs> a lot of viewer complaints this week. We had a oh. conversation uh, last week. Uh, we were talking about how I was trying to push Ubuntu Linux on you. And, <laughs> and they felt bad for me? Is that well, what the complaints are? Well, viewers are just not so sure. You know, so I changed your mug this week. Is I don't know if the viewers can see that. It is indeed, yeah, it's a SpongeBob mug now. Again, I appreciate it. Again, is. with the endorsements, I would rather it be an Ubuntu uh, <laughs> mug. But in order to make that compromise, we also have mm. to, viewers said, you know, we're so offended about this one particular thing on the show. And you really need to start censoring some of the content of the show. So happy to oblige our viewers. Uh, we are introducing censorship this week, which we don't Good. like to do. <laughs> But we are going to censor the show just a little bit, so there we go. Oh, you're kidding. <laughs> no, I don't approve. <laughs> oh, my poor Mac. <laughs> That's for you. It's not a Mac anymore, though, is it? It should be. If yeah. I move it, does it... Don't move it. <laughs> <laughs> Stop messing with the censorship. I am not impressed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, beyond that... That should satisfy a couple of your complaints there. Yeah. We have a new blip.tv profile at blip.tv slash category5. You may have heard that Blip TV has uh, extended their service. They are branching out and becoming really the go-to space for 
uh, independent web broadcasters, and uh, it's really, really uh, making a difference there at blip.tv. Uh, check it out, blip.tv slash category5 is where they're featuring us, and uh, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll see some new viewers coming to us through Blip TV's uh, new service. And uh, we're very pleased that, uh, that they've chosen to feature us on that on that service as well. So, very cool. Uh, what do we have coming up in the newsroom? Oh, goodness. Love to know. Well, let's see here. So, a new law could allow the U.S. government and copyright holders to shut down access to certain websites. Scientists have found a planet that could definitely truly support life, and it's close enough to study in the years to come. Sony's PlayStation Network is finally back online for most of the world's users, and please, please, please change your password. And tonight, we say a final farewell to LimeWire as the RIAA celebrates another victory against peer-to-peer -peer sharing. Stick around, these stories are coming up in under 30 minutes. Hmm. Like how the <laughs> censorship just kind of fades in there. Oh, that's horrible. It's fantastic. Okay. Can I put a complaint in if I email sure. you a complaint? Yeah, what's the complaint? Re remove censorship. <laughs> <laughs> this is supposed to be web broadcasting. No more censorship. As the news is about like RIAA and you know all the the censorship that's going on in the internet in the United States and the government censoring the internet content and and you're telling me not to censor the internet. Maybe we should we be gotta anti keep the censored. Happy. Well, we try. And and the, the the people who are listening to this hmm. broadcast tonight as opposed to watching it, have no clue what's going on necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, okay, for those well, of you who are watching, it's a little special treat. <laughs> viewer points. We've got lots of viewers that are uh, increasing in their points. Uh, on our website, category5.tv, we invite you to join the site, become a community member, and you'll have the chance to win some cool awards. Uh, you'll be able to... Uh, progressively get more and more points and one of the ways that we offer those points is by calling on our viewers to submit cool photos week after week you can email live at category5.tv I've got one from Dan Murphy who sent this in uh, from the Masai Mara observation tower at Dream Camp in Kenya Wow! sitting there uh, just enjoying the view I think that would be so cool. It looks so rustic and so... And you know that this is not... This is the genuine article. Mm-hmm. You know, sitting there in Kenya. And uh, uh, it's not It's not like, uh, you know, where, you know, you get these... What are they called? <laughs> tiki huts or whatever yeah. that are just kind of like, you know, they have them in Barrie. Like little paper strands And they were like them. assembled. <laughs> they were assembled like completely non-legitimate. So that, that looks like the real deal. So, uh, and it looks like he's having a good time too. You got, uh, you got to admit. I'm a little jealous, actually. Yeah. I'm a lot jealous. Not that the view here isn't nice. Yeah. Great view of the lights. <laughs> and oh, Sorry about that, people. Don't want to offend. <laughs> uh, okay, thanks, Dan, for the, uh, for the email. We'll give you a couple of points for that. I've got an email, uh, actually a few from Pyrus Rock This World. Uh, first of all, for 100 viewer points, wearing a, uh, a cardigan. And that is definitely a legitimate zip-up cardigan. Mm -hmm. Love it. Love it. Whoop. <laughs> <laughs> and now we, we were talking last week, or no, it must have been like three weeks ago, about, about getting t-shirts made and getting them silk screened. And right. Py yeah. Pyrus Rock went out and actually got um, the Ubuntu logo as well as their, here we go, their avatar uh, silk screened onto a shirt, which is very, very cool. Uh, we'd love to hear how you got that done, and uh, that's very cool. Also... Pyrus Rock uh, went skiing. This is just on the 14th of this month. Wow. And uh, wearing the... In a t-shirt. Uh, wearing the Karmic Koala t-shirt. <laughs> Looks absolutely underdressed. But at least you're representing. Absolutely. But where are you that you've got this much snow at this time of year? Like, we're in Canada, and I would think, like, mm -hmm. you know, you can... You, people make fun of us. Oh, we have no snow. None. Pyrus Rock! <laughs> <laughs> you're skiing. Oh. Oh, but it does look nice, doesn't it? <laughs> so, uh, I don't know. Uh, we've got 100 points for the uh, for the cardigan. Uh, let's say you've got uh, a cool Ubuntu shirt. You're wearing the Karmic Koala shirt. So, mm -hmm. I'd say you're representing open source Linux. So, uh, we'll throw you another 100 viewer points uh, so for a total of 200 viewer points this week. And uh, certainly, we appreciate uh, everybody who's participating in that, uh, submitting uh, viewer pictures and 
we'd invite you to uh, to send yours in. This week, I'd like to change things up. Uh, we've been doing the cardigan for a while based on the... Oh, sorry. Uh, based on the, uh, the the Tuesday song, you'll find it at cat5.tv slash Tuesday, uh, the cardigan. Uh, what I want to do th- uh, over the next few weeks is uh, bring up Category 5 TV on your device, uh, be it uh, your 37-inch TV or be it your portable <laughs> device or your, your iPad or other tablet device. Uh, whatever you use to watch the show, we'd love to, uh, we'd love to have a picture of, of that setup. Uh, and especially if you can get you know a couple people around that setup, if you've got a big TV, get some people in the shot, uh, including yourself if possible, and, and send us that picture at live at category5.tv. We're going to be awarding some viewer points based on the pictures that are submitted this week. Um, and uh, you'll notice as well when you log into our website, we have upped the ante every day that you log in. You're going to get 10 viewer points for the time being. Wow. Very cool stuff. So we must have some questions coming in. Uh, I've got the chat room open as well. So feel free to say hey. All right, so come out? let's have a look here. <clears throat> From Joe. Usually say hi, Joe. Sorry, I actually had my water in Well, my I just, head. I'm saying that it's just Hi, usually, Joe. There you go. <laughs> Joe. <laughs> so please find attach a screenshot of an error message I get every time I log on to Category 5 TV. Any idea what is it, what it is? Everything seems to work just fine. By the way, I just installed Perfect Ubuntu 6. Thanks. So. Hmm. Okay. So the error message. This is when you first log in. Does anybody else get anything like this? First thing I would try is dumping your cache just in case. But the there's a couple of weird things that I see here. First thing is that it's defaulting to Hillary's bio, hmm. which I wonder if your cache for some reason is locked has locked you into that session and is trying to point to an item 92 which doesn't exist and then this is this is actually our 404 error we have this set up uh, because we re- redesigned the website over the well back in January 1st um, so I built a, a nice little 404 screen so that it would make recommendations based on what you're looking for but for some reason it's erroneously directing you to this pardon me to this 404 page so can you dump your cache, Joe, and, and uh, if you're in Firefox, shift, control, delete, and, uh, and clear that out. I hate to do that to you if you've got other stuff saved that you, that you need in your cache. Um, you can do so without clearing passwords and things like that. Um, just to rule that out, or try it from another computer in the house and, and see if, uh, if that eliminates that. Anybody else have um, a similar problem? Oh, it works now. Fantastic. Uh, MMD Murphy saying, dump your cache my way. Ha <laughs> ha. Yeah. Excellent. Well, glad that fixed it. Yeah, Joe. So, yeah. from John R. Streets. Hey, John R. Streets. He says... Hey, John R. Streets. It's been a while, <laughs> buddy. He says... Nice to have you along. Hi, Robbie. Hey. I'm still around. I just got stuck on the shek- the second shift. The what? <laughs> the, the second shift. You say shift. what? <laughs> well, sorry. All right. I will be back on the third shift soon, and will glad, will glad be sorry, will be glad when I can join you guys live again. On Linux, I can make a new folder with my file browser: Nautilus in GNOME, Dolphin in KDE. That's sorry. right. It doesn't matter which one; they all seem to do it. And if I name it with more than one word, like my folder, then I try to cd to that directory. Via the command line, I get no such file or directory. As long as I name it with only one word, all is good. I can make the same folder with mk directory my folder with the command line and the file browsers can see it and so can the command line. I have Googled around about it and it doesn't seem to be a big problem, Hmm. but it drove me crazy for a while. I would like to know if you have any idea why this happens. Yeah, I think Gadwill's got it in the chat room. You're missing some slashes there. Uh, So what's happening... If I follow you correctly, I'm, I'm going to just jump on my desktop here. I'm going to create a new folder in Nautilus. Now, you were, you were st- stumbling over that, not sure what, uh, what Nautilus uh, is. And what that is is, like, you know, in Windows, you've got My Computer. Mm-hmm. In Mac, you've got Finder. And in Linux, you've got either, it could be any one of mm-hmm. the different uh, types of file management utilities. So you've got Nautilus is mm-hmm. basically GNOME. Uh, so when I bring up my computer or create folders and things like that, that's what I'm seeing. Uh, or I guess it's Dolphin in KDE, which is another desktop environment. So 
Okay, so I'm going to create a folder here, and I'm going to call this, as you're saying, my folder. So in that folder, I can bring it up, I can double click on it, and I can do stuff in there using Nautilus or just my standard GUI stuff. But if I go to my terminal, and I go into CD desktop, and then try CD my folder, it's going to say no such file or directory. And the reason for that is because there's a space in that file name. So what we need to do is we can do two things. We can go CD my with a capital M because I typed it that way, and then I can hit, hit tab on my keyboard, and it's going to automatically fill in the rest of it, and I hit enter, and it's done. Or I can type it manually, CD my slash folder, and hit enter, and that's going to work. Or here's another way. I can go CD space quote my folder without the slash, and that's also going to take me in there. You've got to have those, those quotes around it, though, Otherwise, you're not gonna, uh, it's not going to recognize the space. If you create a folder the way that you're showing in, in the email to Krista there, you, what you've done is you've gone make dir my folder. And what you're actually doing in that case is you're creating two folders. One of them is called my and the other one is called folder. So if I hit enter on that and then I go cd my folder, what I'm actually saying is change to the my directory because it omits it forgets about what you're typing after the space so now you see that I'm in the folder called my if I go back to cd dot dot I can also go cd folder because that was created when we did cd my space folder so now back at my Nautilus if I go into that original folder you'll see that there are two folders now one called folder and one called my so again using uh, using bash or terminal here we could go make dir for make directory originally we're using cd for change directory uh, we could put this in quotes my folder and that's gonna have done it so you see we've got one called folder one called my and now we've got one called my folder for example and the same algorithm or the same uh, method uh, applies you can use the slash as well so make dir my slash space folder that's called an escape character so anytime there's a character in there that um, is not compatible with terminal, uh, it has to be escaped. So that would be like a quote. If you put a quote in a file name, I don't know if you can do that anyway, but I guess you can. See how I've put a quote in this file name? I put, hello, quote. So if I wanted to change directories to that in, in terminal, I'd have to go cd space hello with a capital H slash quote because I need the escape character for that quote to be inputted without being interpreted as an actual quote. All right. Basic semantics as far as how, uh, how your file system uh, functions. I hope that that, uh, that, that helps. Cheers. <laughs> Artie Streets is in the chat room says, Ah, thanks. That was driving me nuts. <laughs> and what a hard thing to search for in Google, because like, it's just it's semantics, right? It's just all about how you're how you're trying to change the directory in in terminal. So uh, I hope that helps. And when in doubt, put quotes around it, and you'll be good to go. Because then you can put spaces if, in the file name if you want. So cool. Great. Thanks for the question, and great to see you. <laughs> so another email from Medi, Medi. Sorry. <laughs> well, we'll call you Matey. We'll call you Matey. <laughs> Says, hello, Robbie, and Krista, and the Cat5 TV team. Hello. Hey. <laughs> I have been following the web development series and it's a great help for me. I'm using GIMP 2.6, sorry, Krista, for graphic designing, but for programming, I'm using Visual Web Developer 2010 in Windows 7. And he says, sorry, Robbie. <laughs> now, I'd be interested to know because we've tried to keep this very. Uh, application neutral, mm -hmm. how, how well that's been working out for you, that you're using a, a Windows-based application that's designed for ASP. Hmm. It says, because I'm only familiar with ASP.NET and, sorry, C. C Sharp? Sure. Okay. <laughs> so far, I followed each and every step with success, but I want to know whether I can finish it with ASP.NET and can host it with APAC. APAC 2 in Ubuntu 11.04. Apache, kind of, sorry. Apache. I, I, Mac. I just clued. Sorry. I was like, APAC, <laughs> APAC, Apache. I spelled it out in my head. I got gotcha. you. Mac. Can you do ASP 2 on... Photoshop. <laughs> on, uh, so you want to do ASP.NET 2.0 on Apache. Uh, there's a module uh, that you can install, but you've got to have a Windows server, and I'd never recommend 
having a Windows server uh, running a website. I mean, you're just you're just asking for trouble. Um, <laughs> it's it's really your call if you want to stay the ASP route. What we're going to be covering is going to be based on open source technologies like uh, PHP, being able to ins install a LAMP stack and, and boom, you're you're up and running. It's free software. ASP is based on Microsoft's proprietary .NET framework, so you're locked into Microsoft's products. You can install Apache onto that server if you want instead of using IIS, uh, but you have to have .NET 2.0 installed or whatever it is, whatever it takes to, to give the uh, Apache module uh, access to ASP. So that said, you wouldn't be able to host that on a, on a Linux box, uh, which is the preferred mechanism for hosting websites just basically around <laughs> the world. Like that's, that's the way it is. You can't deny that. I'm not not denying it. Mm -hmm. Mm -mm. Okay. Okay. What was the other, the first question? It kind of was a two-parter, wasn't it? Oh, let's have a look. Oh, about using... Familiar with... Being able to follow along with... You should be able to follow along and, and do what we do, because your IDE, the, the application that you're using, is, is, gonna, is going to work with PHP. It's just text editing, basically, right? But what we're doing is going to be staying away from any kind of proprietary uh, technologies as, m as much as we can. I mean, we're using file formats like JPEG and stuff like that, but no big deal there. Okay. But cool that you're following along. I hope that you're, you're getting much out of it. Um, my, my leniency is, is definitely towards Linux and open source mm -hmm. and uh, uh, for so many reasons, for security reasons and for just cost effectiveness and, and the fact that you know why would why buy something like a, an ASP server when you can do more and do it more securely on a Linux server and gen that's general I mean that is opinion but that's general consensus as far as web hosting goes I think you're gonna find that most people would prefer to host on a Linux server in which case PHP is the ideal solution so final blogger is uh, is the the person uh, who's asking the question about ASP. Uh, how, how well versed are you at ASP.net? Because if you're, if you're not too locked down to it, I would encourage you to try new, like try PHP and follow along with us. And you're, you're seeing already that we're doing some HTML and CSS, which is stuff that you're going to be doing anyways, uh, like C Sharp. So I think you'll find that because C Sharp is I mean, PHP is PHP is a lot of fun. Kodar's uh, 360 says in the chat room there. I've heard that PHP is a great language to learn when you're doing programming with languages like C++ and C Sharp because they're they're kind of similar in their in their syntax. Um, but I'm not a I'm I don't program in either of those languages, so I don't know that for a fact. But you might be interested to see um, how that transcends. Cool. All right. So Thanks for the question, and uh, hope that sort of answers. Yeah. From Pyrus Rock. Hey, Pyrus Rock. <laughs> I was just watching episode 166 where you covered mounting the Pogo plug in, in, sorry, in anticipation of setting mine up and was concerned that the password is in plain text. Ah. I thought I'd suggest something to make the mount more secure if when you type dot slash pogo plug, etc., you put a space in front of the command. You'll make the command not log, therefore mm. someone can't just press up and see your password. You, you know, that is a fantastic suggestion, and I, and I thank you for that. Uh, what Pyrus Rock is saying there is just put a space before the command to run pogo plug fs, uh, which, which is a brilliant suggestion. Thank you. And I'll, I'll definitely make that suggestion as well. And, uh, and I'm going to try to keep that in mind for, for future tutorials too, because if I do, for example, if I go echo hello, and it's going to echo out hello, but now if I push my up arrow, I, I see that command. So what Pyrus Rock is saying is instead push space echo test123, which is echoing out test123, but if I push up, my history only shows echo hello, which was the first command. It's not saving that to history. So I, I really do like that suggestion a lot. Thank you very much, Pyrus Rock. And I, uh, I think that works great in the case of the Pogo Plug. If you're entering your password, you don't want someone to be able to sit down at your computer and type in the word history. I'm just going to output all of your, uh, your, your past things that you've typed into your computer in, in Bosch. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a fantastic suggestion. Thank you. He also says, I'm sorry to say goodbye to John. Indeed, us too. He will be missed. 
And last question mm -hmm. uh, from Michelle. Hey, Michelle. She says, how can I connect from my home computer to my work network uh, to my work network to work from home. I'm okay. running Windows Vista at home and on Wi-Fi. My work system is running Windows 7. Hmm. So you want to be able to remote in basically to your computer at work, which it, you know the best thing that you can do in a, in the case that you're using Windows is probably use uh, you can use the free version of like Log Me In for example um, if you want to keep it really really simple. Uh, let's see logmein.com just like it sounds and what this software does is it allows it specifically allows you to access your computer from basically from anywhere you do it through a web browser so what you would do is you would install this application on your work computer the Windows 7 computer the advantage to doing something like that is that it kind of circumvents the need to talk to your IT administrator and say I want to be able to remote in can you open up the ports on the firewall and then all of a sudden you've got some security issues and things here's a secure way that you can for free access your computer from outside of the uh, the work network and uh, and that pretty much works every time and there is a free version it's a little bit stripped down versus the commercial version I think for your needs just being that you want to be able to access your work computer from home I think that's gonna work just fine it's logmein.com all one word Give it a try. Let us know uh, how that works and uh, and if that uh, solves the issue for you. And hopefully that uh, hopefully that does. Great. And all the open source fanatics are saying, "Why are you recommending something that's proprietary?" <laughs> She's on Windows, gang. Let's keep it simple. Keep it simple. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Are you ready for news? Can you believe like we're half half in already? There's so many questions. I know. Curious people. Wild. So many people with questions. Are you ready then? I am. She's like clicking around. Speaking of, ready. I don't know what. <laughs> bringing up Dreamweaver and she's. Are we gonna do the news? I oh, you thought. Do oh, the I, was, news. I wasn't very. Specific you weren't specific. That. I know. You just said, "Are you ready?" And then ready for what? It's, it's time for the news. Oh, well, but news time. <laughs> I thought I would mention before before we get into that. I got an email from you this afternoon, mm -hmm. which is you very did. pleasing <laughs> unto myself as well as many many people around the world. And maybe you could express a little bit about what that was about. About the email? Yes. <sighs> I wrote my bio. <laughs> she wrote her bio. So, ladies and gentlemen, we will have a bio for Krista Wells up on the website for. Uh, within the next day or two, I suppose. Excellent. Yeah, thanks for doing that. <laughs> We're all volunteers here, so, I mean, we can, we can hound her, and we can, we can be like, where's the bio? And well, that's really all we can do. Yeah. Thanks. I wrote it. It happened. Cheers. Appreciate that. All right. Great. To the newsroom! <laughs> all right. So, from the Category 5.TV newsroom... Websites that link to pirated music and movies or sell counterfeit goods could soon be blocked in America. U.S. politicians are about to consider legislation which includes a raft of measures to clamp down on such sites. Sites targeted under the Protect IP Act would be removed from the Internet's address books, making them hard to find by their well-known domain name. As well as letting government take action, the Protect IP Act would allow copyright holders, holders to allow for court orders to get sites blocked or delisted. Sherwin Slide, Deputy, Deputy Legal Director, sorry, Director at the Public Knowledge Digital Rights Group is concerned and says that if this act is passed, it would accelerate the net down a path that could lead to governments everywhere sanitizing online content so citizens only get what those in power think they should see. A Red Dwarf Star 20 Light Years Away is again providing hints that it hosts the first definitively habitable planet outside our solar system. The planet Gliese 581D is at the colder outer edge of the Goldilocks zone. Serious? Yeah, <laughs> In, it's gold. <laughs> Do you know what that means? Is that no. like there's this belt that they say this is where habitable, hab habitable. See, we both can stumble. <laughs> habitable planets can exist throughout this belt. It's a certain, mm -hmm. you know, distance from the sun, and Earth is right smack in the middle of this belt, and this planet is just on the outskirts of that. So there's this All right. assumption that it's close enough to that habitable belt. Cool. 
who knows? So read on to the outer edge of the Goldilocks zone, <laughs> in which liquid water can be sustained, as well as porridge. <laughs> mm. Now, a study in Astrophysical Journal Letters suggests that its atmosphere may keep things warm enough for water. They contend that conditions could be suitable for oceans of liquid water as well as clouds and rainfall. However, Gleis, Gleis 581D's denser air and the rim red light from its host star would make for a murky environment that would be toxic to humans. Dr. Robin Wordsworth, a member of the team from the Institute Pier. Pierre Simon Le Place in Paris. This discovery is important because it's the first time climate modulars have proved that the planet is potentially habitable and all observers agree that the ex exoplanet exists. Because the planet is also relatively close to Earth, it is believed that upcoming satellites and telescopes should give us a chance to look closer. As we all know, Sony was forced to close the PlayStation Network a month ago when hackers gained access to members' personal details. Since then, the Japanese electronics giant has been working to improve its security systems. Having recently restored the PlayStation Network, the service had to be taken back offline briefly due to the sheer number of users trying to change their passwords. Limited service has now been restored in most countries, including the UK and the United States. Sony is offering its users a welcome back package of premium content, including a free game. LimeWire was a cross-platform computer program that used peer-to-peer -peer technology to help people find media on other computers and let others see and download their libraries of files. LimeWire has reached an out-of-court settlement which record labels that, with record labels that sued it for helping people pirate music. The Lime Group, which developed the LimeWire system, has agreed to pay around $105 million to 13 music firms. The prolonged legal fight has led to LimeWire being shut down. Get the full stories at category5.tv slash newsroom. The category5.tv newsroom is researched by Rory W. Nash with contributions by our community of viewers. If you have a news story you think is worthy of on-air mention, email newsroom at category5.tv. For the category5.tv newsroom, I'm Krista Wells. Thanks, Krista. <laughs> Great job. Thanks. Tonight's show is brought to you in part by Pogo Plug at cat5.tv slash Pogo Plug. And, of course, Planet Calypso. You can get the free online game from cat5.tv slash Calypso. Let's jump into our feature for tonight. Yay! It's part 11 of our web development series. Hop on over to demo.cat5.tv slash 009, and you'll see what we've been working on. Now, last week you'll recall that we had a, uh, an issue with the footer. And being that we're a live show, sometimes these things happen, and sometimes there's not enough time to actually look over the source code and say, like I would in, in business, you mm -hmm. know, okay, well, what's actually going on here? Uh, because we're live, and, and so that's, uh, that's something that can sometimes happen. So we put out a, uh, pardon me, a note on the show notes for last week's show, and I said, do you know what could be the problem? Uh, post your comments below and watch episode number 199 to see if you were right. And uh, we got one response to that, and that comes from T.S. Gurr, who, uh, who suggested that we visit a particular, pardon me, a particular website. You can get that link from the bottom of the show notes for episode number 190. Uh, and uh, just was suggesting that you could create a class for the footer and, uh, and actually make it just kind of sit at the very bottom of the site at all times using a particular tutorial. Um, so that's not the method that we're going to be using, T.S. Gurr, but we will throw some viewer points your way for the uh, valiant effort and uh, and unfortunately, nobody got the uh, the answer quite where we wanted it to be this week. Immediately after the show last week, I said, "Oh, <laughs> oh, yeah. we figured it out." It was literally like that, just like that. Um, so I'm going to bring up my CSS file for uh, for this website, style.css, and we'll immediately see what actually happened here when we look at the uh, at the site. We're playing around and our main body contains a relative positioning. That main body has a top positioning which means it's moving it down from the top by 85 pixels and yet we were trying to add a footer of only 60 pixels so it's not even going to be visible. It's hidden completely behind something that has been pushed down 85 mm -hmm. pixels. So if I want to show 60 pixels of this footer I basically have to make sure that it is going to be, for one, higher than 85 pixels because that's 
what we've bumped down the uh, main body by with position relative. So I'm just going to go 85 plus, and I want it to be 60 pixels. Uh, I could do it that way. No, you know what? I'm going to do position relative as well, because if I'm correct in this, let's see what happens if I bring this up. Again, it's 009 tonight is the, uh, the folder that we're working with, so head on over to demo.cat5.tv slash 009. There's our footer. We're not going to take too much time with the footer because really cosmetics to me right now are not all that important. But you see that that's exactly the effect that we were going for. 60 pixels at the bottom. And you saw it happen live. All I did was I copied the position relative top 85 and I pasted that to position relative top 85 for footer. Because again, what's happening there, if you envision um, your you know, a piece of paper that you've drawn a square on, and you said, okay, you know what, I'm going to take that square, I'm going to position it relatively, I'm going to move it down 85 pixels. But because it's been moved relatively, it's going to actually overlap anything that's not positioned relatively, it, so the next element is actually going to fall underneath. So that, that footer was there, but it's only 60 pixels high, so it's, it's too short to actually show below the, uh, the position relative. So what we've done now is we said, okay, take this footer now, and we're going to move that down the same amount of space, 85 pixels, and it's going to start right at the bottom of that, that, uh, that main body wrapper, and then it's going to spew out that 60 pixels for our footer, which is just giving us that nice little bit of padding that we wanted. So now when we look at 009, you see that our site is it's got that 60 pixels of padding and everything else we're pretty pleased with and it's the way we want to be so tonight we're finally gonna get into some PHP not just basic PHP just to get us started but to understand the relation between now we've done CSS well we've done it first of all we did the the PSD mm -hmm. we did the graphics we sliced the graphics into JPEGs and pings and things like that and then we use CSS and HTML what you've seen so far has been just straight HTML uh, with some CSS2, a little bit of, I don't even think that we used any CSS3, so it's all stuff that's going to be uh, reasonably cross-browser compatible, and that's something that you do need to be mindful of if you're going to be doing websites for, uh, for clients and things, is testing across, you know, people do use Internet Explorer, plain and simple, so you do have to test on Internet Explorer, and if, there's, if there are problems, which are, is often the case because IE doesn't uh, conform to web standards the way that uh, that Firefox and Safari and WebKit based browsers do. Um, so you got to watch out for that kind of stuff. This is a fairly simple layout, so we're we're probably not going to experience any issues uh, that are substantial enough to to make it look wrong in another browser because we're keeping things pretty simple. So, but you may run into that, so be mindful of that. Okay, so looking at that, I'm going to close out of the file that I'm editing live on the server because what I'm about to do is going to happen on my computer itself. Okay, I've got my index file. Style is going to stay where it is and stay the way that it is. And imagine, okay, so we've got this file and we've got our menu. And the menu is the perfect example of where PHP includes become this fantastic tool that you're never going to want to live without. If you end up with a site, and I see this all the time on older sites that were developed by you know, people that worked strictly in flat HTML, you get a website with this menu, and they end up with you know, 30 or 40 different files with a copy of this menu. So as the site grows, they're constantly adding content, constantly adding content, until you know, you've got 30, 40, 50 files, <laughs> and all of those are basically copies of this index.php, but it's HTML. So if that customer, or if I, if it was my own website, said, okay, now we've got home and about us, uh, here we are, we've got 300 files on our website, and now we want to also add, you know, whatever, a blog. My goodness. <laughs> so now you, you look at that and you say, oh no, I've got this crazy static menu that mm -hmm. I, I have to go through every single file and there are tools to help make that, you know, to expedite that process. But generally speaking, I've got to go through every single file and make that change, like this, to 300 different files, you know. And oh my goodness, is that ever a pain? 
Or, you know, suddenly we want to search engine optimize. And this, this file used to be called ab.php because it, it originally we thought, well, that would that'd be fine. But then we realized, you know, that's not very well search engine optimized, so we want to rename that file about us.php, and we got to go through 300 different files and edit this, this file. So with PHP includes, you're going to find that tonight we're going to actually make that process, we're going to eliminate that process and that frustration, that headache that could happen because we've got to plan ahead with our websites. That's why you'll notice in the header of this file even, we have title, and we've got a PHP echoing out of the word title, a string called title. You're going to learn what that does next week. In the meantime, for tonight, we're going to start slicing this thing up and we're going to create this into a PHP file. So I'm going to start at the top of my file, and I'm, I'm at the very, very top, and I'm highlighting down. And I'm thinking logically that this file is, that this, uh, what I'm looking at right now is the header of my file. So I'm going to keep going. I'm highlighting, highlighting. Oh, but now I'm at the body. Okay. So I'm just going to cut. Now I've got that in my clipboard. I've left body. What's in my clipboard is just the header. So I'm going to create a new file. I'm going to paste in what's in my clipboard. And now I've got everything that was in the header. And I'm going to file, save as. Back at my website here, I'm going to create a new folder because we've never done this before. I'm going to call this includes, which is just my way of being organized. It doesn't have to be called includes. And I'm going to call this because I like to be, I want, I want everything to be easy to understand so that it's not complicated for me and it's not complicated for the next guy who needs to edit this site. I'm just going to call it header.php. So now I know that there's a file called header.php and when I see that, that is the header of my website. So if I ever need to change anything, if I ever want to add jQuery to my site so that I have some cool Ajax effects and things like that, I can do so by only editing that one file. It's header.php. But now my site's completely broken. If I upload that change, Okay, so I'm just uploading index.php, and those of you who are on 009, do a, a quick refresh with me, and you'll see, oh my, what happened here? This is what happens when you're missing the CSS, mm -hmm. because remember, this thing is powered strictly by CSS, so it's a broken. reason for that is, is because we need to now tell our index.php, hey, we need to open a PHP command, and we're going to close it, always open and close. Uh, just so you don't accidentally forget and then wonder why you're getting a syntax error. And we're going to go require once is one that we can use. Okay. And it looks like that. Okay. Or we can go include, which is fine in this case. And we'll learn uh, the difference. Look up the difference between that. There is require. Okay. Require once means it's only going to happen once. And then there's include. We're going to use include in this case, but look them up. Go to php.net, look up the difference of each of those, and understand why that's the case. We're going to go dot slash includes, because that's the folder that we place this in, header.php. Save that file. We're going to now remember we need to upload our includes folder, because that's never been uploaded before. Okay. And we're going to upload our index.php which now has that include. If I refresh again, 009, you notice it's exactly the same as it, as it used to be when that header was a part of this file. But in actuality, it's not. It's a separate file. So now if we need to change the header from now on, we only have to do that in one place. Anything that we want to change there. Because it's our index... Yeah, our index, this is great for templating. This is great for... Uh, skinning your site and things like that. It's just fantastic. Um, and now, if you imagine, if this file became, even in its current state, if, the, if it grew to the point where there are 300 different files, my header is only one file. Okay? So what we, wanna, what we want to achieve is we want each of those 300 files to be only the content for that one page. But if I ever need to change any part of the design itself, I only have to do it in one file. So next, let's look at our site, and we're going to say, okay, this is all kind of static for all of our website. This is not a page-specific item. Okay, so that's our logo, that's our original wrapper, and what we're going to call this, first let's paste it into a file and decide what we're going to call it logically. Okay, I'm going to call this body dot open dot php 
And the reason I'm putting the word body first is that I'm also going to have a body.close.php so that I know that, uh, that that file is part of the body. And all I'm doing is I'm saying, okay, now open that instead of having it as a part of this file. You probably never edit that body.open.php. It's irrelevant, but it is necessary. Now you'll see I've got my menu. Woohoo! Let's make it so simple. Okay, I'm going to create a new file. And uh, of course, what are we going to call this? We're going to call it menu.php. I'm just saving that. Notice I'm, again, saving this into the includes folder. And now I'm going to include includes menu.php. So all of the same stuff is happening, but now if customer or I need to change the menu, I have one file that I need to edit. It's in includes and it's called menu.php. How much easier could that be? Okay. Moving along, uh, we've got our header up at the top. Does the header ever change? The header is static for the entire site, let's say. In this case, we make great things happen. That's all part mm -hmm. of this site. So really the only thing that's going to change from page to page is this lorem ipsum text. Right? And that may be different for your site. We're using this site as our demo, but we're going to say that this is uh, this is only for this particular demo. So I'm going to cut that. I'm going to create a new file. And I'm going to save that as this is our Polaroid or our header. Uh, but we're not going to call it header because that's going to confuse that original, you know, the header file. But we can call this, uh, I think the Polaroid idea is, is a good idea. Because we will always know that that's our Polaroid. Notice that everything is ending in .php. Because each of these files can become dynamic. We can, we're including them and, we, and that file can include other files. That file can run PHP commands. And we call that Polaroid. Dot PHP and the motor along. Now you'll notice now we've got our div ID equals main body. That's the start of our site. Now this stuff is the only stuff that's ever going to change. I'm going to clean it up so that visually I'm not going to accidentally delete that slash div when I'm editing the site. I know that that is part of the template or the skin, the, the layout of the site. So now I'm just below that slash div because remember this div is closing main body. Okay. So down below that, I'm going to cut all this stuff out right down to the very, very bottom. And I could create a separate file for footer. I don't think it's necessary uh, because there's really nothing there that's too, you know, too advanced or, you know, like I don't need to ever separate that really. It's not a huge footer. I'm going to just call this body.close.php. And now where that stuff would have been back in our index.php. We're going to include it. Remember, we got to open PHP. we got to close PHP. we got to go include includes slash body.close.php. It's always good to have a, you know, you don't have to name the files like I do, but it's always good to have um, a method to your, to your madness, if you will. Uh, a naming algorithm that you always use because I always know that my files have style.css. I always know that my sites have a header.php so I know where things are, are found if I need to get to them. So now I've got this site that looks exactly like it did but from a code perspective it looks like this. There's our lorem ipsum. It's really easy to read now. It doesn't look like a clutter mess. Okay, So now that's our index.php. Watch this. We're going to open menu.php. We're going to change the link for about us. We're going to call it about us.php. Notice I'm using search engine, uh, search engine uh, safe, search engine friendly URL. The underscore is like a space. And I'm making it so that it's about us. Not too critical with about us because not too many people are going to search for that. But it gets critical when you're working with a client that has you know, more detailed menu item names. You can infuse keywords into the file names and that's going to increase your standings. So now remember, this is index.php. This is our home. I'm going to go file, save as, watch how easy this is, about <laughs> us.php. Okay? So now here's about us and I'm going to change this to go blah, 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 about us. Okay? So that's the entire contents of our about us 
file. So I'm going to upload includes and index.php and about us.php. The reason I'm uploading includes again is because it has my menu.php, remember? And I added that link to about us. So if I refresh now and I point to about us and I click on it, uh, look, I'm still on home, okay? I'm going to click on about us. Let's maximize a little bit. And I'm clicking. And there it is. Okay. Now we have uh, some white space at the bottom which we can fill. That's not a problem. But you'll see that now I can go back and forth between things, uh, between different pages. And if I go back to my menu.php or whatever else, I can change things. I can add another menu item just by you know adding it like that. Okay. And all I need to do now is I've changed that one file. I'm going to go into includes. I'm going to upload menu.php. Overwrite. FileZilla has just asked me if I want to overwrite the existing file. And now if I refresh, remember I'm on aboutus.php. Refresh. Hello. New menu item. Go home. I'm on home. Index.php. And that hello still exists on that page. So you can see how as we grow this website, it's mm -hmm. going to be become very, very simple to change things. Uh, but also it puts our, our code in a, a kind of a modular way so that if they want a site redesign, for example, well, we're still working with a header.php, a menu.php, and we can structure it so that we can just replace those files and it's boom, it's a whole new graphical layout if that's something that they request. So, uh, so that is uh, part 11 of Category 5 TV's web development series. You can find out more and get yourself some extremely affordable... A steal on web hosting at cat5.tv slash webdev and we welcome your comments there as well and uh, if you're really enjoying this uh, this uh, feature uh, you can flatter us uh, we'd encourage you also to uh, possibly donate uh, we're raising funds to replace the microphones that uh, have uh, failed us um, this is again a loner tonight that uh, has been so graciously uh, loaned to us uh, by uh, music pro in Barry and I'd encourage you if you're in the Barry area to please uh, show your appreciation for what they're doing for the show by uh, visiting Music Pro uh, on Barry View Drive in Barry and uh, make a purchase, or even just let them know that uh, that you appreciate them pitching in and, and helping us through this this issue that we've had. Uh, but your donations will go specifically towards uh, the purchase of new microphones and our new server that uh, that uh, got hit by a surge that um, unfortunately has damaged it um, beyond repair. So. Um, and of course, you have the opportunity when you donate to to uh, to allocate those funds in a different way if you prefer. So uh, we appreciate everybody who's donated this week as well. Uh, we're well on our way to to getting there. Uh, we have the Flatter feature on our website as well, cat5.tv/flatter. If you're a Flatter user, um, and what else have we got going on? Wirecast. So much stuff going on here at Category Five this week. I've got my my little sticky notes, and, and I said, like, <laughs> you can tell it's going to be a busy show. i got, like, a whole row of sticky notes. Uh, Wirecast, cat5.tv slash win. And uh, we are going to be closing down the uh, the draw for that, or the, uh, the voting process okay. of that. This is your very absolute last chance to vote, uh, because this week that is going to be shut down. Cat5.tv slash win. Please cast your vote there. Uh, to help us to decide who is going to be the winner of that uh, of that software. Wirecast is the software that we use here at Category 5 TV, uh, which allows us to do really fancy things like censoring Mac logos. I don't know that that's what they ever intended on the uh, software box, but it is <laughs> very cool. We can do a lot of cool things. Mm -hmm. Wirecast broadcasts our show. It records our show to disk for us for the RSS feeds later. Everything that you see uh, happen here is powered by Wirecast, and we couldn't do it without them. And uh, so we're going to be giving away a copy of that next week. Uh, we are ready to give it away, but we want to give you just this one final chance uh, to get your votes in, cat5.tv slash win. And entry number two, it looks like, is winning by a landslide. So, you know, this is your chance. Tip the get scales. Get in there. Yep, tip the scales. Mm -hmm. And speaking of voting, uh, as a registered viewer, you can vote for your favorite episodes at category5.tv. 
and we love to hear what you think of our, our episodes. You can post your comments, but there is a five-star system that you can vote from one to five. Let us know what your favorite or least favorite episodes of Category 5 are, and uh, that is at Category5.tv. Boy, the hour flies by, doesn't it? I know. It seems like I just got here. You did. And now it's over. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty cool stuff, though, eh? Yeah, it's been yeah. fun. You enjoying yourself? Oh, always. Yeah. Always, always. Good, good. Mm-hmm. Looking at the chat room. Hey, everybody. <laughs> Jot says, why did you just censor that Ubuntu logo by putting an apple over it? That's not cool. <laughs> Sorry about that, dude. I'll put it back to the way it's supposed to be. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> I had to say something. <laughs> it was meant to be a joke, not a uh, not a permanent solution to the problem. A solution? I suggested this isn't that, a problem. Well, perhaps duct tape would would blend oh, quite well. No, 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 no. We don't put duct tape on the Mac. It's either that or spray paint. No, no, no. no. <laughs> we'll stick with the overlay for now. Overlay is good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, final blogger is asking what software we use to upload files. Uh, what kind of files are we talking about? Our show, or uh, what kind of what kind of files? Let me know, because we have literally like two minutes. PHP files. I'm using a yeah. program called FileZilla Client. You can go to, I, I'm guessing, I think it's just FileZilla.org. Let's try it. I'll say that verbally, and it will, it, it will be completely wrong. Uh, and it is FileZilla. I'm just gonna, oh come on, Google it. It might be .com. FileZilla. Let's see. Oh. I was way off. FileZilla-Project.org. Hmm. This uh, this client is compatible with all platforms. It's fantastic. It really is a great application, and, and I've been using it. Um, I used to use... I mean, back in my Windows days, I had a very similar application. Uh, I can't even remember what it was. And then I tried GFTP for the longest time, and it wasn't doing it for me. Um, FileZilla client is fantastic. Really, really great. And, of course, it's free. How did I throw that in there as well? There you go, filezilla-project.org. If you heard any web address uh, on the show tonight that you want to get, uh, if you didn't catch it, you can check out the show notes. This is episode number 191, and you go to our website, category5.tv, click on Watch the Show, and you'll see a list of all the different episodes that have been aired, and you can just click on the show notes for each episode, and this, again, is 191, and you can get the links at the bottom of that file. Mm-hmm. Everyone's uh, uh, interested in your shirt tonight. Oh yeah. What's uh, what's going on? It makes me look like I'm a sporty guy, <laughs> like I like I played football in the school, but not really. It was just a discount at the Walmart store. Perfect. Yeah. You know. That's the best kind of shirt. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, Pyrus Rock is just saying uh, that they like GFTP because it supports SSH, and I will say that so does FileZilla Client. SFTP, baby. Uh, Invincible Mutant, it's either. You can you can connect to any kind of server with... with uh, it's got FTP, SFTP, FTP over implicit TLS SSL, or FTP over explicit TLS SSL. So you really, you're not limited with the uh, FileZilla client. Cool. Cool? Yeah! Cool, cool. Boy, oh boy. Uh, Dman810 saying, can't wait to see me in Entropia Universe. That's Planet Calypso, cat5.tv slash Calypso. Can't wait to see you too. Um, join our society. Um, now, I should mention too, I don't always remember to check the society terminal. And I've had a couple of people that join the society. Thinking of Ubox, for example, there were a couple of others who tried to join the society and they timed out. I only have a certain number of days to, to authorize you as a member of the society. So if I'm out in the boonies and I'm, you know, hunting or whatever else it is <laughs> that I'm doing on, on Planet Calypso, uh, I don't necessarily have access to a society terminal. So I get there and then I realize that I missed a couple people. So if you got missed, mm -hmm. it's just because I was out hunting or, or doing something <laughs> on, on the planet that, that wasn't near a society terminal. So either that or I was working in real life and didn't get on. Tends to happen. That happens. Real That's life. more realistically what probably <laughs> happened. Who knew? Yeah. So just uh, re, uh, retry to join our society if you got missed. All right. Well, hey. I, uh, it was a great job tonight. It was nice having you on the news, and that was fun. It's, uh, that was intense. Fun or funny. Lo loads of fun. Both. No, you did well. Both. You always do well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Great. 
that's that's all the time we have. What do we do? Um, I guess we'll see you next Tuesday then, because okay. that's that's it. That's the only logical thing to see you yeah. next Tuesday. All right. Yeah, if not before. You take care. Have a great week. Thanks for See being you. here with us. Category5.tv. And, uh, of course, you can follow us on Twitter as well. Uh, Category5TV is our Twitter uh, name as well. So see you next Tuesday. Night. Bye.